Hi, I'm Stan Stokes. I've been painting professionally for 40 years now. 40 years. In those 40 years, I found out an awful lot of information that nobody has ever bothered to tell me just simply by stumbling across it, trying to get paintings done. This is just ways of doing things, techniques and stuff that nobody seems to ever get around to telling you about. If somebody had told me these things years ago, it would have saved me an awful lot of time and aggravation. So I've decided to share this with anybody who really cares to watch by doing a painting start to finish and videotaping and filming it all along the way. Now I'm not going to be saying that this is how you should do a painting. This is how I do paintings, but you might be able to pick up little techniques, little bits of information that can probably help you with about any type of painting that you do. For over three years now, I've been creating paintings for a book that I'm putting together on the Tuskegee Airmen. The painting that I will be doing for you will be for this book. This particular painting is of Harry Stewart, and I'll tell more about him later. The painting that I will be creating for you will be a scene at Moton Airfield, Tuskegee, Alabama. In that scene you will see the first five guys to get their wings and later become full-fledged Tuskegee Airmen flying combat in Europe. Now, the very first thing I do when I get the canvas ready, when it's all gessoed, sanded, and ready to go, is to underpaint it. You want to get rid of that white. I usually use cadmium red light. There's a lot of other colors you can use to underpaint, but the most important thing is to get rid of that white. I'm using cadmium red light on this particular painting because I want to have a warm, sunsetty feel to the entire painting. And painting the clouds in, and a lot of the background, and even a lot of the foreground. Leaving some of the orange, just minute little amounts of orange in there coming through will warm up the entire painting. You could also use colors like raw sienna for your underpaint. You always just have to make sure that some of it comes through, you don't cover the entire thing up. Raw sienna will give a painting that really nice antique look. If you need a dark painting, a very moody looking painting, you can do a very dark gray to begin with. It just makes the whole rest of the painting easier. Now I could show you painting the cadmium red on the canvas, but I think you can figure that out. So we're just going to set this canvas aside and we're going to go on to the next thing, which is figuring the painting out and drawing it. I like to do the drawings full size so that I know exactly where I'm going with the canvas. I don't like to mess around not knowing things with the canvas. This will enable me to establish the horizon line, your eye level, which goes right across there. The light source, which is the sun coming from that direction in this case, heading in that direction. So the shadows are going that way. The clouds in the background will be lit up from this side. And it just lets you know the basics of where you want to go with the painting. I will be showing you how we can transfer everything from the drawing to the canvas, keeping things nice, neat, and accurate. The first thing to do now with the actual canvas is to mark off the horizon line. You can take that right from the drawing. It's going to be right there. Remove the drawing. Measure how far that is down. It's just over 11 inches. So just over 11 inches over here. Make sure you're accurate. Draw the horizon line, and there's your beginning. Everything is going to work off the horizon line. Now with the drawing, I use a very sharp exacto knife on a rubber cutting mat, and cut out all roof lines, everything else that's going to go up into the sky, so I need to know, I, I can figure out exactly where my sky is going to be. With the drawing taped back up onto the canvas, now you can go in, separate it a little bit so you can get through, and draw right where everything is. And this way you don't have to be painting sky where it's not going to show.
there. So I know over here, the sky's going to be above that line. Don't paint below that line. Something that I always do without fail is to tape my drawings back together again. You're going to be needing them intact. You don't want to be losing anything. So just take the moment to tape it all back together again. And when you're done with the whole thing, you can crumple the whole drawing up and throw it away with a great sense of accomplishment. Now for some painting basics. Uh, I generally use a very limited palette, trying to keep things as simple as possible. You don't need all those colors out there that are on the rack that look so nice because you can make them from all these basic colors. Here, just very few of them. Titanium white, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, cadmium red, raw sienna, burnt sienna, cobalt blue, and black. And occasionally when I need them, I'll use bright red and some phthalo blue. And believe me, from those you can mix up just about anything you're going to need. Using a photo of some really nice clouds that I took actually in Boston, don't tell anybody but it was Boston. Uh, using this I have chalked in, uh, it's probably somewhat hard to see, but I've chalked in the basics of where the clouds are going to be, that's right in there and everything. And then this is the line that I don't want to paint clouds any lower than, because that's going to get into buildings and airplanes and stuff. So now I will actually start to paint. This is a little bit of the sky, just kind of roughing it in. And believe it or not, this is cobalt blue with, of course, white in it, but with a little bit of raw sienna to kind of calm down that cobalt blue. We don't want this to be an electric blue. We want it to be a calm blue. It's hard to tell with all this orange behind it right now, but you'll see how it works. Now I've added more white, more yellow, more cadmium red, and that gets me into the lighter colors. The nice thing about oils, which this is oil paint, is that you can do nice blending of things together, make really nice effects. And even though I painted with acrylics for years, just can't do this with acrylics. For years, I was afraid of oil paints. I had heard all the horror stories of how complicated and everything it was. So I kept painting with acrylic. One day, I just decided I needed to paint with oils, and it didn't take me very long to realize I should have been painting with oils all along. They're nice. So now I'm going to finish roughing in the sky. As soon as I'm done with all the roughing in process, then we have to set this aside for a couple of days for it to dry. Uh, the mediums I'm using, it will be dry in a couple of days, and next time I will show you exactly what those are that I use. They're really good too. At the end of part one, I had just been roughing in the clouds, just getting paint on there, getting it to where it generally looked like the cloud. I set it aside for a few days to dry, and then a little earlier, I went it through, and I touched up the clouds where things were a little bit too rough and everything, but being careful not to cover up too much. Uh, I still want that spontaneous feel and that a little bit of that cadmium red still leaking through. I wasn't trying to copy the clouds verbatim from the photo. You don't really need to do that. The clouds would be changing in another 10 seconds anyway. Just trying to merely get the essence of the clouds. I've now transferred 
more of my drawing, the background part of the drawing, to the canvas. I don't know how well you can see it, but everything back in there is ready for me to start painting more background. Last October, I traveled to Tuskegee, Alabama for the grand opening of the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. While I was there, I photographed absolutely everything. One of the things I photographed, which was lucky when I realized I was going to be doing this painting, was the hangar and the tower at Moton Field. This is what's going to be in our background. I took this photo early in the day when it was still quite gray out. The sun had not come out. A little while later, when we were all sitting there for the grand opening, the sun did come out and baked us all to a crisp. As you recall in part one, I mentioned that I use a couple of new things that really make oil painting a whole lot nicer. One of the things is Alcid Mediums, uh, Gamblin from Portland, Oregon. They put a G on the front of a ring, so they call it Galcid. But anyway, an Alcid Medium replaces the linseed oil. The linseed oil used to be the root of all those scary stories you used to hear about paint falling off of canvases and cracking and everything. This stuff is tough. This is what I use and it dries relatively quickly. The other thing that I highly recommend is anybody's odorless mineral spirits so you're not sitting here breathing in all this stuff. Uh, that really helps out in keeping you alive. This is important so pay attention. These two little pots that I have on my palette, this one has the, the alkyd medium in it, Gamblin's Galkid. This has the odorless mineral spirits in it. This replaces what everybody used to use, the linseed oil. And this just replaces the stuff that used to stink a lot. You use just enough of the alkyd medium with your paints to mix it up to hold it together. It is the binder, it's what will hold it to the canvas. You use just enough of the mineral spirits to make it flow as you need. One thing that's very good to have is a good assistant. An assistant that will tell you when you're doing something wrong. An assistant that has a very good eye for art. And I have one. Chesbo. Chesbo. Smile for everybody. Now that's an assistant. Painting in some of the treetops, some of the background. And it is green, but the green, even though I don't have green on my palette, the green is put together using cobalt blue, raw sienna, and the cadmium yellow. That gives you kind of a, a warm green. I'm painting the opening of the hangar door and on the camera it probably looks black but it shouldn't be black, it's back a little bit. If you don't tone it down a little bit it's going to overpower the foreground. So you have to push it back a little bit making it a little bit lighter. And I actually used the leftovers from my green mixing some black in it and that toned the black down a little bit. While we're roughing it in, we don't have to be all that precise on things. You just want to get some basic color down. If you make a mistake here and there, it's very easy to correct it once the paint's dry. At this stage, we're not concerning ourselves with any details. Uh, notice I'm not putting any doors, windows, or anything. There's just no need to do it right now. It's not necessary. It'll be very easy to do later. We just want to get that paint on the canvas right now. You can see that we're getting things basically established at this point. The, the hangar, the tower, the trees, the sky. And you can even see 
the ghost of the airplane beginning to appear in there. There, that will be yellow, and then the blue fuselage and yellow wings down here. But we're beginning to have something that looks like something. I want to give you a quick little word about oil paints. Uh, this applies across the board. If you buy cheap oil paints, they're going to work cheap. The main difference between the expensive paints and the cheap paints is the expensive paints have a whole lot more pigment in them than the cheap paint. So if you're using cheap paint, you're going to have to use a whole lot more of it that kind of makes up the difference in the cost. Uh, the brands I use of uh, good ones are Gamblin, once again. Well, Holbin is a good paint. Rather expensive, but good. And then uh, upper grades of Grumbacher are good. The Grumbacher student grade stuff, it's for students. You only want to use it if, you're, if you can't afford anything else. Once again, on mixing, use a little bit of the actual paint, the pigment, and then a dab of the Galkid. And then the Galkid can get a little bit gummy and everything, so you need to add just a little bit of mineral spirits, just enough so that it will move around without sticking anything, and then you're good to go. Hi, I'm Stan Stokes and welcome back for part three. When we ended part two, I was in the process of roughing in all the basic colors. As you can tell, I continued on filling in, making it to where we have the basic color on the entire canvas covering up for the most part that orange. Now I've taped the drawing back up again to get more details. Every time we do this we get into the finer parts of the painting and it actually gets to be a lot more fun. You can also see that uh, we no longer needed anything down here. So this is one of those times when you cut this off in here and in here is where the shadows are going to be. But you don't need that whole lower part of the drawing anymore so you can toss it away. Just a moment for a quick little word about paint brushes. A good paintbrush is your best friend. If you have a bad paintbrush, it'll fight you all the way. It'll make life miserable. You just want to get rid of it. So spending money on a good paintbrush is an essential thing. And boy, do I spend money on paintbrushes. Part one, I showed you the painting that I had done of Harry Stewart. On April 1st of 1945, flying over Hungary, Harry Stewart and others of the 332nd Fighter Group got into a huge dogfight. In that dogfight, Harry managed to shoot down three German planes. That's why he has his three fingers up. He got three victories on that day. After the war, Harry stayed in the Air Force. And in 1949, along with two other pilots from the 332nd Fighter Group, Alva Temple and James Harvey, they participated in the 1949 William Tell gunnery meet at Nellis Air Force Base. And the short of it is that they won. They beat all the other fighter groups in the United States Air Force. The Air Force's uh, general idea about the whole thing is, oh well, there will be next year. And they even lost the trophy for a little while. But ultimately, within a few weeks, the Air Force had decided to completely desegregate and spread these guys out amongst the Air Force. Okay, down to business now. I'm painting in the windows, the doors, uh, actually the cockpit area, all the other details where we're getting a little bit closer to doing things that make the airplane, the building, everything else start to really look good. 
There's still no need to be all that precise. We're still basically roughing in colors. Since I'm doing uh, an area that's back a little ways, also you want to remember to not make the colors too bold. Instead of using black in here, this is a fairly dark gray, but that helps to push it back in the whole feeling of the painting. This is one of those times that I'll expand my palette a bit and bring in bright red. Uh, the cadmium red light that I use otherwise just isn't the red that I need. I need uh, a red that would be an insignia red for the stripes on this. There really is no magic to all this. It's all planning. You can see the pencil lines I have drawn out there. That's from the drawing. And it's just, uh, at this point, it's almost a paint-by-number thing. I happen to know the numbers. But it's not all that difficult. I'll continue on to apply, apply all of our basic colors. I want to get it to where everything is looking approximately how I want it to. Next time we'll go in and we'll start adding more shading, more highlights, more reflective light, and everything that really starts to make it look sharp. Oh, uh, one other quick thing about next time, we're going to take a little field trip out to the Palm Springs Air Museum. But for you to be able to come, you have to bring a note from home or we won't allow you on the bus. Hi, welcome back for part four. I hope you remember to bring the note from home because we're about to get on the bus to go to the Palm Springs Air Museum. Come on. Well, here we are at the Palm Springs Air Museum and I'd like to introduce you to Tuskegee Airman Rusty Burns. This is a Stearman primary trainer. This is the aircraft that Stan has in his painting. The Stearman is the airplane that we initially learned to fly in. We were taught how to take it all, how to take off, fly around, and land without doing much damage. This airplane was a good teacher. It wasn't easy to fly, but when you mastered it, the Air Corps knew you had the makings of a good pilot. The only difference between this airplane and the one that Stan is painting is the paint job. This airplane is painted as a Navy airplane, and the one that Stan will be painting will be Army colors. Well, thank you, Rusty. This has been fun and enlightening. And now, everybody back on the bus. And because you've been so good, we're going to stop at In N Out Burgers on the way. Rusty's buying. Now that we're back and we're full of In N Out Burgers and fries, I hope you're ready to get to work. Uh, you've got some ketchup on your shirt. As you can see, I've continued on. I've used my drawing, I've cut out more areas, transferring the drawing over and filled in more areas with just basic colors, but I've also started doing some highlights. I've had several of you ask me, where are the people? There's no people happening in the painting. I like to get everything else done, make it to where the, the whole background is working, and then I put the people in. That way I can optimize where they're going to be, I can make them look their best. This is the point that the painting starts being a whole lot more fun. You start getting to paint in the details. Every detail you paint in makes the painting look just that much better. This is when, uh, in my humble opinion, that the painting really starts coming to life.
Don't let yourself be overwhelmed by the magnitude of everything you have to do. Just break it down into section by section like I'm doing. Try to be methodical about it and you'll be, actually be amazed at how fast it'll go. Now for a little tip. Uh, any of you astute viewers have noticed I'm using quite frequently this type of brush. It's called Simply Simmons. You can get those for $3.99, at least last time I looked, which is incredibly cheap. They hold up okay, but the main thing is that $3.99, after they're not holding up okay, instead of hoarding them like I do all the rest of the paintbrushes, you can throw them away. So using our nice inexpensive paintbrush here, just keep working, keep uh, putting details in. Patience is the number one virtue when it comes to oil painting and perseverance. You always have to be thinking about your light source, what direction your light is coming from, where the shadows are being cast, and where the highlights are going to be hitting. Now on this, the sun's coming from this direction. This area still is looking a little flat. That's because there would be highlights from the sun hitting it. So thinking about it, you'd be going in here and adding some highlights. And like, like you see, you don't have to be all that neat about it at this stage. Keep adding highlights, keep uh, shading, and the most important thing is to pause every once in a while and take a look at what you're doing. See how everything fits together? I do an awful lot of thinking about my paintings. I'm not going to show you that because that would be terribly boring for you to watch. In the next part, uh, part five, I think we're going to get far enough along with all this to where we will be able to start painting the people in. Uh, that'll be really interesting. It's so between now and when we start part five, keep painting. Welcome back for part five. Chisbo loves french fries. Today we're going to start painting the people into the painting. As I mentioned before, the people that are going to be in this painting are the first five of the Tuskegee Airmen to have gotten their wings. These five men were Spanky Roberts, Benjamin Davis Jr., Charles Debeau, Mac Ross, and Lemuel Custis. This fellow is one of their instructors. I always urge you to get to know your subject as well as you can. The better you know the subject, the better the painting is going to turn out. I've got a massive file on my computer of all these guys and all the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, lots of photos. Here's another photo of them early on. Here's General Davis talking to another fellow who actually I'm going to be changing into somebody else. Spanky Roberts. Colonel George Spanky Roberts, and I've gotten to know his family. They're great people. He died quite a while ago, but everybody who knew him said he was a great person. He was the second commanding officer of the 332nd Fighter Group. With my photos handy, I sat down and I drew out exactly how I wanted these different fellows to appear. All five of them and they are in it. This guy is going to be leaning on the airplane. And then over here. The next thing to do is to cut them out. But one thing that some people probably don't realize is the best way to draw the people out to where they're the size that you want them to be is the eye level is right about along in there. Anybody standing at any distance back and forth, their eye level is going to be right there on level ground. So the, the different guys, Benjamin O. Davis is going to be here. He's a little taller. Spanky Roberts was a little bit more compact. He's going to be right in here. You draw them out, seeing where you want their feet to be. And that, between their eyes and their feet, that will determine just how tall they're going to be. Just like we have previously done with 
the drawing of the airplane, we cut out the silhouette of the person. Just carefully going around, cutting on the lines, and we will use this to position the person exactly where we want them on the painting. With all of the drawings cut out now and little tabs of tape put on, uh, we put them where we think we're going to want to have them on the painting. Right about there, that's going to be Charles DeBow. And Benjamin Davis Jr. He was the real spearhead of the whole thing. Without him, the Tuskegee Airmen wouldn't have happened. One thing you'll notice here, this is Mac Ross. I'm going to have him to where he's leaning on the airplane, standing where this part of the stabilizer's in front of him, and I drew his legs in anyway, just to make sure I got everything looking right on him. And this fellow is Colonel Roberts. He was the, as I will say, most compact of the bunch. Placing him there. With him, we also have the stabilizer will be in front of him. I don't know if you can see it, but I actually drew where it will be on there. But I still drew his entire body in just to make sure that everything looked right with him, that I didn't wind up with his legs looking too short or too long. Now, one thing I do with all of them, with almost everybody I ever paint, is I will make their legs slightly longer than they really are in life. It just makes them look better, but it's only slightly longer. The last but not least of our five will be Lemuel Custis, and I'm putting him on the other side of the airplane, which will kind of balance the whole thing out a little bit. So right about in there, and he also is going to be standing behind the stabilizer, so you won't see that part of him. But once again, it makes it much easier just to draw the whole thing. Now is a really good time to step back and take a real good look at the painting. You want to make sure that the composition is in balance. You want to see if everybody is working with everybody. Looks like they're having a little conversation. Everybody's kind of aimed in the same direction there towards the center, about where Benjamin Davis would be. Uh, right now is when you want to make any adjustments because once we start painting, it's going to get a lot harder. If you're comfortable with the placement of everybody on the painting, now you just draw around their silhouette, simple as that, all the way around everybody, and once we have done that all the way around, we paint. This next step may surprise you a little bit. It's not how you generally, you know, in the movies, see people do paintings of things. But with the outlines of the people drawn in, I just simply paint the entire area black. Just carefully going along, staying inside the line. And it's one reason why I haven't gone back and really cleaned up the background all that much, because we're going to cover some of it up now. This is one of those things I had to find out on my own, something that I wish somebody really had told me about a long time ago. If you paint in the entire area where the person's going to be, it makes it so much easier to paint the person. As you're painting them, it will, you'll see it's... It, it just streamlines the whole thing. It gives you instant depth. A 
while these guys are drying the next few days we can go in and start touching up everything else we now know what we're covering up and what's going to still show so we can go in and uh, there's only one coat on that make it look a lot better make everything in here look a lot better I want to touch up the clouds a little bit and by the time I'm done doing that they ought to be dry so that next time we can really start getting into the nitty-gritty of painting people Mmm, those french fries were good. Hi, Stan here for Sham Wow. You'll say wow every time. Guys, I think that's the wrong script. Hi, Stan Stokes here. Welcome back for part six. In your absence, I've done a little bit of work on the painting. I've smoothed out the clouds. I've added some highlights in there. Just got the clouds to where I like them now. I've also started on two of the guys, Charles DeBow and Benjamin O'Davis Jr. With both of them, I've just done one session, one coat of paint over the black. But you can see that uh, there's a little bit of dimension starting already. And the way I'll show you doing this, uh, it makes it to where it gets that 3D feel fairly quickly. As you can see with Spanky Roberts, who is just the basic black silhouette at this point, I have actually drawn in some of the basics of where his eyes are, his face, and his hell, or uh, the goggles. From this, I do one coat of paint, just kind of playing around with the face, as much as you can with one coat of paint on both of their faces just trying to get it to where it vaguely looks like the person and then I leave it alone to dry. While I'm working on a particular individual I try to have as much good reference material on that person as possible. I want to be able to get the essence of that person's face, uh, their personality through the skin. In Colonel Roberts case I have painted him before you can see that painting elsewhere on my website. Still, I want to have all the good stuff I can to make him look really good. I know his family and I want to make them proud with this. Uh, I'm doing the basic, his basic pose from this particular pose. The problem with this is, is with his face, he looks like he's looking down or has his eyes closed. I have another good photo of him here where he's got more of that attitude and everybody said he really kind of had that confident attitude. Uh, they all love the guy. Uh, he's looking up and it makes it to where he's looking up over in this direction so it works well. So I'm using this face with this body and it's okay because it's all Colonel George Spanky Roberts. I've mixed a little uh, burnt sienna and raw sienna together with some of the galcad medium. Enough of the galcad medium to make it flow nicely. And then you just simply start looking at the photo, start painting in the nice warm tones that the two colors together make. And just, just, you just start laying in color. There's plenty of time to make everything look good, but you've got to get some color on there first. Starting the face with a very dark color and continuously working your way lighter, the finished product will wind up having a much richer, much deeper feel to it than it would otherwise. You'll quite often go through a period with the face where the person's face actually starts looking pretty weird. And that's where you just have to have confidence to keep working on it and head in the right direction and eventually it's going to actually look like the person if you just stay with it. Quite frequently what I see with other people's artwork is it looks like they've just quit too, too quickly. I've added some white, and actually a little bit of yellow to the whole mixture. 
and start working in a little bit lighter at a time, blending as you're going. I'm trying to start getting the feel of the person's face ever so slightly, but be patient with it all. All you're interested in right now is just getting the, the very basics of the person's face. Don't worry about all the little fine details and like I said, if it looks a little strange, it will for a while. Just stay with it. Now we're going a little bit lighter. And I don't just add the white because that starts making things a little washed out. I added a little bit more of the raw sienna also. And one thing you've probably noticed in this photo, he has his overseas cap on. And we're not going to have him with the overseas cap on. We're going to have him with good old-fashioned helmet and goggles. And you probably realized that this was on my computer and I printed it backwards to get him going this way. The overseas cap would be tilted the other way. You always have to watch out for all those little things, especially when you're playing around with computers. You can get yourself very far away from reality. Just keep working on the face, pause occasionally to look between what you're doing and what you're seeing in the photo, or photos, and start trying to pick up all the little things that make a person's face, all the little subtle little lines, the way the lips are, the way the eyes are, the, he has kind of a heavy eyelid there, uh, all the little details there, and just keep working on it. And eventually it starts looking better and better. Well, this is just the first time through. You don't want to worry about getting everything perfect at this point. It's just the first time through with the painting, with the face. And you get it to just about that point, and I generally leave it alone until it's dry. With his face drying, I go in and start painting the other things that you don't have to be so precise about. Painting in his tie, they were always well dressed and manicured even when they were in training. Probably especially when they were in training. In the next part, we will be refining their faces. Welcome back for part seven. No, Chesbo, you don't get to show them how you paint yet. That'll be next time. This time we'll finish Colonel George Spanky Roberts' face. And once we're done with that, we will go ahead and tidy up all the other guys. And at that point, our guys will be complete. I have taped this photo back up. I uh, want it to be nice and close, so it'll be real easy to see all the things that make up his face right from the photo. I mixed up a little raw sienna, a little bit of cadmium yellow, and a little bit of white, and a little bit of the galkid to make it flow and also to stick together. Um, what you want to do with the galcut is mix enough in there to where the paint becomes fluid, but not too much. Uh, if you add too much to it later on, the thing can wrinkle. Uh, a little bit of thinner 
if needed. Also just to keep it flowing because the, the galcon will get sticky after a while. So you just slowly start picking up the highlights of the face. That's what will give it the roundness and the believability to make it look like it's a real person rather than an abstract. Once you have a lot of the highlights worked in, at that point you'll start blending them in with a little bit darker color. And that's also the beauty of oil paints. You can do all the blending you want. Right there. When you're working on something as complicated as a face, uh, when you've worked on it a while for the day and you're kind of comfortable with your progress, it's a good idea to just set it aside and let it dry well. That way the next time you paint on it, if you make any mistakes or anything, you can go back and wipe it right off. It's not going to hurt what you've already finished. Your best tool you can have in your inventory when you're painting is a good deal of patience. What we're going to do now is something that I consider to be just plain fun. There's nothing really exacting about it like when you're painting somebody's face. We're going to paint Spanky's leather jacket on there. I have taped a photo up here of Tuskegee class 44i all wearing leather jackets. The sun's facing the same direction that we're facing. So it's really good examples of how leather jackets are going to look in this particular setting. Class 44i just happens to be the class that Rusty Burns was in. Here is a young Rusty Burns. Back when he was young and full of that fighter pilot ego. Now he's 83. He's still full of the fighter pilot ego. Since we already have the dark foundation in here, I've gone ahead and painted in with fairly dark colors some of what the uh, leather is actually doing in here. Now what we want to do is start picking up the highlights. What makes leather look like leather is all the highlights that you get. Just slowly work your way across, getting all the logical highlights in there, every place that uh, a little bit of shininess would be picking up the light. For this I'm actually using a little bit of burnt sienna and of course white. And if the burnt sienna starts looking too brown I add a little bit of the cobalt blue. And that kind of tames it down. This is a case where you just follow the wrinkles. The tops of the wrinkles are where the highlights will be. Now we're going to paint his boots. Once again I've started with black throughout the whole area and we're just working on the highlights. Since the boots are black, the only thing that's going to be really showing up is all the highlights. And a lot of it, all you have to do is hint at what's there. Just hint at laces. Because nobody's actually going to be looking. If they do, they've got too much time on their hands. So you just want it to where the eye thinks, okay, there's boots there. It's 
just picking up the essential highlights. And to finish it off, there, he's got nice shiny boots. Well, that will finish it up for part seven. Next time in part eight, we'll finish the whole thing and culminate by signing the painting, which is always the most wonderful thing about doing a painting. Welcome back for part eight. This time we finish the painting. After looking at the painting for a few days, I decided we needed to have something over in here to fill this empty space. So as you can see, I've started to paint in a truck. I painted another truck just kind of hidden around the corner there. This one I will detail a little bit more, but once again, it's only there to fill a space. It's not there to be a main attraction of the painting. I found a nice photo of a 1940 Ford pickup. Uh, it's the right vintage, and we are stateside, so we would have civilian vehicles along with military vehicles around. So it's totally appropriate, and essentially you just start painting in. And I've started off with the whole thing being black. I've drawn in the fenders, all the, the main parts, so now I'm free to just go and start to paint it. You want to just keep analyzing how everything looks in the photo and try to replicate it in your painting. And the most important thing, once again, is just simply to have patience. You just want to work with it until it works with the painting. Since this is not a focal point of the painting, it really doesn't matter uh, how it looks. The most important thing is that it works with the rest of the painting. I wanted to mention again uh, the use of Gamblin's Galpid medium, or anybody else's medium for that matter. Uh, the only problem I've ever had with this is that I have rushed things from time to time and started painting where the paint underneath really isn't dry and that causes problems. You start to realize after a bit when you're working on it that it becomes very fragile. It's very easy to scrape it and it's better just to once again make certain the thing is really dry before you put another coat on. I've already painted a Jeep in on the other side. It kind of felt like there was a little void over there that needed a little something and I thought a Jeep would be a perfect thing to put in there. There are times when you've painted a very light area against a dark area and it feels a little on the stark side. You want to be able to warm it up, soften it up. The easiest way of doing that is to take a little bit of yellow, orange, or cadmium red light, depending on the colors and what you want to do with them, and just run it along that edge in between the light and the dark and it warms the whole thing up, it softens it up, and just gives a real nice glow to that whole area. A couple of days ago I painted some numbers on the side of the airplane. wanted to get the first coat on because you're never going to cover especially a dark area with a light area with one coat. It's always going to take at least two coats. So a couple of days ago I painted it in. That way it would be dry enough today for me to be able to go in and show you that I am actually painting it. All of the military airplanes stateside had big numbers painted on the side of them. These were called buzz numbers. 
And the buzz numbers happened because if you were a, an 18, 19, 20-year-old young man and you were the fighter pilot type and even the bomber type and you were given a pretty hefty piece of machinery to fly around, you were going to want to go out and show off. The big numbers were an effort to keep the guys from showing off. I don't think it worked too well from all the stories I've heard. But anyway, that's why these are called buzz numbers. It was the numbers that people could see when they were being buzzed. One other area that looked like it was a little on the stark side, needed a little something to jazz it up, was this area in here. It was just too plain. So a couple of days ago, I painted in these dark spots that right now look like the steerman had a really bad oil leak, but that's not really what it is. That is the area that is now becoming wet spots, little water puddles. So after all, it did rain earlier. You can tell by the clouds. So starting off with the dark area, you can paint the reflections in, and all of a sudden, you have damp ramp area. There are times that you're painting that it just doesn't feel like the paintbrush is blending quite like you would like it to. That's when one of the most useful things comes in, and that's the human finger. You can just really blend the painting nicely. Well, there you have it. The one last thing now is to sign the painting. I always draw a straight line because I don't want to have a crooked signature. Well, that finishes the painting. The only thing is that Chesbo wants you to see how well he can paint too. This bow is a bud dog or bad dog? Bad, okay, bad dog. Okay, give me back the paintbrush. You're dismissed. Go on. Well, that concludes our painting demo. We'll put a really good image of this up on the website so you can see it in more detail. I will probably be doing this same thing on my other website, stanstokes.net doing one of my ship paintings. Until then, good painting.